Welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, and today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to explore why farmers are painting eyeballs on cow butts, and we'll do a deep dive on honeybees who are trained to find landmines in Croatia. Let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the very first episode of Bewilder Beasts. Before we get started, let me give you a little background on this podcast before we jump in. You know, get to know each other a little bit. Now, at the beginning of the summer, everything went upside down. I know this has been a very hard year for a lot of kids and their parents. But in Somerville, the city that I live in, during the COVID-19 experience, lots of people jumped in to help. And in this way, they helped by putting together a free online virtual summer camp for the kids of our city. During that virtual summer camp, I was able to volunteer some time to teach kids about animals. I had no idea what I was doing. I'm just a dog trainer outside of Boston. I only usually work with dogs, but I love science. I love animals and I love fun facts and I adore teaching. So I put all of those things together for an animal fun class where kids and curious adults could learn about animals who changed history, like a cow who was framed for starting the Great Chicago Foy- the Great Chicago Fire. Spoiler alert, she didn't. But as a result of the city burning down, the story of that cow inspired another country to help Chicagoans start what has become the second largest library system in the United States. Before this, you had to pay to use the library. We're going to talk about more about this story in a future episode of Bewilderbeasts. But we had also talked about animals who help humans, like dogs who can detect COVID-19 and cancer. And we also discussed people who work with animals in case, you know, the kids who are watching wanted to grow up and work with animals at some point during their lives, or the adults wanted to make a career change. Many of those topics will be fleshed out here in future episodes too, but one animal stuck out as my absolute favorite and was the inspiration for this entire podcast. If you picked this to listen to, thank you to all four of you who chimed in who are either students or my daughter. But if you actually picked this because you noticed a picture or were curious about this, you might have noticed the logo Bewilder Beasts and a pink flower with a bee. But if you look carefully at that flower and the logo, do you notice something about it? You can totally pause this and go back and look at that logo if you want to. But there is a cartoon bomb lit in the middle of that flower, and the bee is walking right towards it. That logo for this podcast that you are listening to right now was inspired by the Croatian bomb bees, my very favorite thing that I learned while I was teaching those kids this summer about animals. So let's learn about how bees halfway across the globe are saving towns and people from certain death from unexploded landmines. But first... Did you know that farmers paint eyes on cow butts to protect them from predators? Now where I live, cows live in fields and there are very few natural predators, except for maybe us. But in places where cows live alongside lions, jaguars, and other apex predators, cows are easy pickings and a delicious dinner. They are often picked off by wolves, large cats, and other predators. But according to a study from Communications Biology, when researchers painted giant eyes on bovine booties, they observed lions would not pick those cows to eat. And while this sounds silly, it does make evolutionary sense. So I want you to think about butterflies. Some of those have eye-shaped patterns on their wings to confuse predators. It's hard to sneak up on someone you think is watching you. So now let's take that idea and look at those lions. They attack by sneaking up on their prey. So if they are fooled into thinking they are being watched, the lions lose their advantage. And according to Mental Floss, my favorite website on the internet, this works on humans too. Not that farmers don't kill cows with eyes, but we do fall prey to being watched. For example, when bikes are parked near signs featuring eyes, those bikes were 65% less likely to be taken or stolen. So what does this mean for butt bespectacled cattle? Well, for now, it means that eyes painted on their butts do work well, but if all cows had these markings, predators might just get desperate and still attack those cows. And over time, they might get wise to this, but they might not. (laughs) 
finally, let's get back to the bees who started it all for this podcast. Are you ready for a deep dive? Let's go. It turns out that using a technique that I use in dog training called associative learning works on nearly every animal. And this might sound super familiar to some of you. Does Pavlov ring a bell? The key to associative learning is pairing something new that doesn't cause an instinctive response to something that does. Ivan Pavlov discovered that his dogs would drool every time food was presented to them, but that if a bell rang just before the food was presented, the sound of the bell would also produce a drool response even if there was no food. But here's the thing. Dogs aren't the only ones who can learn by associative learning. All animals can learn with this technique and it has many practical applications. For example, my cell phone alert sound is the Mario coin sound effect. So when a recent televised basketball game decided to be funny and have that same sound effect every time the home team scored a basket, my body went into response mode. A little burst of adrenaline, oh my phone and I reached for it every time. And it was a high scoring game. <laughs> I eventually put my phone in the other room and I still found myself reaching for the phone that wasn't even there. The sound didn't always produce a reach for my phone response, but it does now. And that's the same for your doorbell or alerts on your phone. And for animals who find explosives, the smell of explosives equal delicious food. By taking the scent of explosives and introducing a small amount of that odor, you don't want to overwhelm the animal, but you do want to just use a little bit just before their favorite food shows up. The odor can predict food is on its way. So why don't they just use dogs? Well, dogs are pretty expensive to train for this kind of work. Plus, you need one handler for every dog you use. Dogs are heavy, and if they make a misstep, that's a bad day. The two biggest advantages of using bees over dogs, bees learn this faster, and you can have a swarm of bees on the hunt for an underground landmine instead of one or two Labrador retrievers. Bees can be taught in just one or two days to seek out novel odors, new scents, including those of buried landmines in Croatia. Remnants of the Croatian War for Independence, otherwise known as the Balkan Wars. Since the start of the Balkan War in 1991, it's estimated that 2,500 people have died from landmine explosions alone. And the 90,000 miles that were scattered across the country, they were placed at random and without any sort of map. And while it's impossible to put a leash on a bee, or even tag them with little microchips that we can use to track them, drones can follow groups of trained bees to see where they congregate, and it worked. By mixing sugar water with a little bit of TNT odor, the bees learned that a little TNT smell, the amount on an underground mine, predicted food for the bee and they were able to lead bomb clearance teams to unexploded landmines so they could be cleared safely. This saved lives. Now, unsurprisingly in my line of work, when people discover they can get great behavior with honey, they decide to maybe try to use a stick. One woman had decided to try to train her bees for the German police force by shocking the bees that are sniffing odors like explosives and drugs. So why use shock or pain when sugar water works just as well? Pavlov's, Pavlov's theory does work the other way too. So while dogs heard a bell and would drool for food, you could just as easily condition an animal or person to fear something by association too. So for me, I'm terrified of spiders, like super scared. I appreciate the work they do and I love them on paper and in theory, but even sitting in this closet recording this podcast and just the thought of maybe one here with me is making me have an adrenaline-like response. Whew, I'm good. Okay, so um, I once reacted to the possibility of a spider by panicking so intensely I jumped backwards and I threw a table I was sitting at and it was all pure instinct. So to say that I'm afraid of spiders is a bit of an understatement. I have worked hard and I am getting better, but I still can't go into fields with tall grasses because to me, tall grass equals trapped with spiders after an incident when I was a small girl chasing a soccer ball into tall grass. 
And after I picked up that ball and I looked around, I was surrounded by spiders. Tall grass equals spiders. Tall grass equals nervous and anxious. Thanks, Pavlov. My suspicion is that the individuals who want to use shock to train bees to hate the smell of drugs is hoping for a more visceral response from the bees, which might work. I think she wants them to buzz and attack and show that the drugs are really there, but it might also cause the bees to shut down or even hate the food that they are associating with that shock. If you've ever had a drink or a food that has, this is a family friendly podcast, so I will say backfired on you. You might not be able to eat that food or drink that drink anymore. And that is unfortunate. Teaching any animal with cruelty not only harms the animal, but it is unnecessary and it tends to have other consequences as well. So be kind to animals. While the saying goes, you might get more with honey than a stick. You will literally get more with sugar than with shock. And the funniest of fun facts for me, my name is Melissa, and it is Greek for honeybee. Melissophilia means I love bees, and Melissophobia means scared of bees, or terrified of large groups of women likely born between 1979 and 1983, as Melissa was a very popular name at that time. So thanks for joining me today on the very first episode of Bewilder Beasts. I'm still working out the details as this is my first episode, but if there are things that you'd like me to talk about on the podcast, historical animals that you found fascinating who changed the world, or maybe even misunderstood creatures, animals who help humans or wacky animals in the news, please send them in. You can send every correspondence to bewilderbeastspod at gmail.com. You can tweet at bewilderbeastspod Bewilderbeast Pod on Facebook and Bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa. Thank you for listening. Now go get curious. I got today's information from gizmodo.com, armytechnology.com, the Times UK, and howstuffworks.com. And of course, my best friend, Wikipedia, which if you are using it, make sure to check the resources and the references that are used in Wikipedia. Links in the description of today's episodes are in the description of today's podcast. Thanks for listening.